Hello and welcome along to The Punter. Great to have your company for another look at the weekend sporting action. And what a fantastic weekend we've got in store. One of the truly big weekends of the sporting calendar with the FA Cup semi-finals and the Grand National. And if you like a punt, well, it's a pretty good weekend to have one. Lots of things going on. We're going to look at all of them. And as ever, we're going to analyse it from a betting point of view and try and find the value for you. I'm delighted to be joined once again by Dan Freeman. Dan, fantastic weekend of sport, isn't it? It's a great weekend of sport. Um, some people don't like the FA Cup semi-finals taking place at Wembley. I think these two matches in particular do deserve to be played on the biggest stage possible. And uh, it just throws it more into the equation when you've got the national as well, which brings everyone into the equation. You don't know many people who don't mm. have a bet on the national. So, you know, it's, it is a great weekend to come. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. And uh, a good time of year for the bookies, as you were saying to me before the show started, they love the national. It's not something that they tend to lose money on ever. And, of course, recently the Masters worked out extremely well for them. Man United, we'll talk about in a second, got beaten midweek. Unfortunately, the bookies are probably having the best of it right now. They're having a, they've had a good week and they're going to have an even better weekend. You're talking about upwards of £2 million being bet. Um, over the weekend, and well, that might just be on the, the national itself. Mm. Um, so, like you say, Masters, uh, you had McElroy and Woods failing at big prices in the end. You had Manchester United losing to Wigan, you know, one of the banker bets of the week. Mm. And now you've got the national. It's, uh, it's certainly a good, uh, good week to be a bookie, but hopefully we can make it uh, a better one for a punter. Yeah, absolutely. You're watching the right show if you want to. We're going to look at the value in all of the big sporting events. We're going to start just by recapping what's been happening with the title race. And, uh, of course, Man United losing and Man City winning has reignited a bit of interest. I'm not having it. I don't think there is a title race. I still think it's locked up. You tell me, you'd make the case for it being on again. It's uh, very much of a, uh, an even divide in terms of people that believe it's over already and people that believe that last night reignited it. I think uh, the prediction from Roberto Mancini that, um, s that United would slip up against Blackburn came about a week uh, later than he thought. They, mm -hmm. they obviously slipped up against Wigan. He wouldn't have thought that at the time. Um, so I'll tell you why there's a title race on because the run-ins that the two teams have got and the fact that they've still got to play each other. Yeah. You, you've got to consider this at the moment that it's going to be two points you because don't, City... You, you don't get five points for beating Man United, no, you get, do you? Yeah, They'll only get three. It'll, and... it'll swing back to two, plus they've got a, uh, an inf a superior goal difference mm -hmm. as well. And uh, if you're going to back Manchester City to win the league... Now is the time because you're not going to get. It's going to get tighter. I can tell you. It's not going to. It's going to. This is going to go right to the wire. It's funny because the punter has been running for almost the exact length of the football season, and throughout most of the football season, me, Russ Wiseman, and Alger have been saying City are the value in this title race because Man United are too short. The last couple of weeks is the only time we've kind of changed our view on that based on the pricing. Let's look at the prices to win the title right now, and. Well, the bookies are saying it's over. Five to one on is pretty close to unbackable. If you do like Manchester City, three and a half to one, is that enough to excite you, Dan? Or would well, you, you watched that price more? tumble in a couple of weeks when City beat United at the Etihad Stadium. Yeah. The fixtures this weekend, uh, United are at home against Aston Villa, who, for my money, are certainly not out of trouble yet. Um, they've got plenty to play for still, and they're a young team. Um, have improved with the kids, it must be said in recent weeks. You though. made a good point about them, which is that they their game in hands against Bolton. Which and is if a they six lose pointer. that, they could get dragged into yeah, things. Certainly, right? and that's in a couple of weeks' time. So that, that's this weekend uh, for, for United. And City go to Norwich, who, yes, won at Tottenham on Monday, but largely don't have anything to play for. Yeah. Um, Norwich took United all the way at Carrow Aid back, back in February. Uh, Ryan Giggs scored a 90th minute winner. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, and, and they've given every single team in the Premier League a run for their money this season, apart from Manchester City. Who mm. they lost 4 0 back there uh, at the Etihad back in November. So, at the moment, like I say, 7 to 2 about City is the time to go now because you won't get a bigger price. I don't think you will. Okay, I'm not, I'll give you 72. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> having it. Um, interesting that uh, this was the first game, the Wigan game, that Paul Scholes hasn't played. And he played, I think, the previous 12 in which Man United had won 11 and drawn 1. So, I don't think he'll miss any of the other games for the for the run in, you know. It was a strange one because um, Skulls had um, travelled with the team uh, only the short distance to Wigan. He was part of the whole match day preparation, mm. and he was in the stands in his tracksuit. Now, whether it was a late call or not, not really know. But 
you know, I th think it's pretty uh, good to say that, yeah, he won't be missing many more games I, for the rest I, of the season. I have to say, I have to say, I don't think enough's been written about what he's done this year. And I'm not a fan of Paul Scholes. I think he's a pretty dirty player and he happens to play for Man United. I happen to be a Liverpool fan. But what he's done this season is sensational. How you miss months of doing something professionally, come back, and then he's been the best player in the league. It's C just extraordinary. Certain pundits will have you believe that they, they would want him back in the England team well, for the Euros. I, why would he not be? He's extraordinary. Anyway, um, got a little bit sidetracked. Let's look back at the top of the Premiership because the other exciting thing that's going on right now is top four. I'm sure you've been following this race as avidly as I have. Would you believe, and we said it on the punter just a few weeks ago, I think it was four weeks ago, Tottenham, four or five weeks ago, Tottenham were 10 to 1 on to finish in the top four. They were unbackable to finish in the top four. And look at them now, the way that the teams are playing, you'd almost say that they were going to struggle to finish in the top four unless they can up their game. Well, after their blip against uh, QPR a couple of weeks ago, Arsenal have bounced back mm. uh, very well. I thought that they thrashed Manchester City 1-0 on Sunday. I thought that they could have won that by a far greater margin. Mm. And of course, Tottenham have slipped up of late. They're in the wrong sort of form for this time of year. A 2-1 reverse at home to Norwich. I'm sorry, I, you know, I really appreciate what Norwich have done this season. And Paul Lambert as a manager, a uh, great deal of credit due to mm. that. But I'm sorry, Tottenham challenging for the top four is not acceptable to lose at home to Norwich no. at this stage in the season. They well, Norwich really don't have much yeah, to play for. They drew at right. Sunderland on uh, Saturday. Uh, last Saturday, sorry. Very similar to the Chelsea game, in fact, a game that they, again, they should have won that Tottenham, but they're just not getting the rub of the green. They're not getting the results at the moment. Chelsea, I think, have got too much on elsewhere. They've got a Champions League um, semi-final to come against Barcelona. They've got uh, an FA Cup semi-final, which we'll talk about later, against Tottenham. Mm. I think that there's a few too many other things going on with them, and uh, the draw against uh, Fulham proved that on Monday. Well, Newcastle, for me, at 4-1, to one, definitely. Yeah, yeah, let's check the odds. You said Newcastle at 4-1. to one. Um, are actually the outsiders, but um, <laughs> you wouldn't, I don't think gonna, the bookies are going to be facing a rush of money to back Spurs at seven to four on no. the way they're playing. No, um, I think I think I think I think the, 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 without a shadow of a doubt the value is Newcastle because of the form that they're in because they've got a goal scorer in red hot form, mm. unbelievable Papis Denver C say it's. He, you said earlier he's become the first goal, so he's the quickest to 10 goals. He's second ever in the yeah. Premier League, yeah, in, like eight, nine, nine games, I think. Yeah, something games. like that. Amazing. And, you know, he's, scoring, he's regularly scoring braces at the moment. A couple mm. of them have been a bit lucky, a couple of dubious offside decisions maybe, but some of the quality that he's come in with as well, the goals against Aston Villa on his debut, mm. away at Swansea last week. Uh, Who'd have you know, thought? Really good player. So definitely players on form, players goal, uh, scoring goals. They've got a tough run in, but mm. I'd fancy Newcastle. Who'd have thought we'd be talking about Newcastle as a recommendation to be top four with so few games left in the season? Amazing, amazing thing that uh, in this age dominated by money. Let's go to the other end of the league. Also a fascinating contest down here. It's clarified a little bit maybe in recent weeks with There's a trap missing the, from that. the trap door opening for a couple of teams. Um, here's the bottom of the table. You said there's a team missing because you think Aston Villa can get sucked into this. Definitely. On 35 points, they're six points above Bolton. The game in hand for both teams is against each other. Yeah. That, for me, means that Aston Villa are still in a relegation battle. They've got injuries left, right and centre. Um, they've got Manchester United away on Saturday and they've got other games. Yet they've got, they've got Sunderland at home and I know some people are saying that'll be the game that will, that will, that will, that will um, you know, sort them out. Mm. I'm sorry, Martin O'Neill going back as manager of Sunderland to Aston Villa yeah. is not going to lie down. Absolutely no way. There may be other fixtures, i.e., against Everton on Bank Holiday Monday that they might throw in. So, the do, you think that, you think they get in? do you think they'll actually be relegated? Because they're 12 to 1 right now. So, as you can see from the odds there, long odds against. You think that. You think they will actually get no. properly sucked into this, or you I just th think they're precarious? I, th I think, I think uh, that's probably the biggest price that you would get at the moment on Aston Villa to mm. be relegated. I think it will sort itself out, because I think there are other teams worse off than them. Wolves are a dead cert to go down. And not applicable. Wolves not applicable. <laughs> Poor Wolves. That's no, that's no good. Uh, QPR, um, with their home form of late, beating Liverpool, Arsenal, and then Swansea last night, very impressively. Mm. Um, you know, I think that They'll have too much. They've got too good a squad with the strikers that they have they've got in that team. Spent the money, haven't yeah. they, to stay up? We can also back teams to stay up individually if you prefer. So rather than batting to be relegated, you can bet to stay up. You can't back Aston Villa to stay up, uh, but if you wanted to bet QPR or Bolton or Wigan, if you want to back Wolves, stay up. You get twenty to one, aren't the bookies generous? I do. <laughs> so tight. I do fancy QPR 
from what I saw last night and from what I've seen at home recently right. to pull something out the bag. They have still got to go to Manchester City last game of the season. They won't want to go there. Wanting uh, to, to, to have having to need to get a, a couple of points to stay up in that one. But uh, Blackburn, for me, 7-5 to five would probably be the pick of the prices there if I was going to back something. And if you had to pick... So if you're going to pick the three, you're going to have Wolves? Wolves, I think Wigan have done superbly well of late. Mm. There's something inside me that says that they, 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 their time may be up. And probably Bolton as well. I know it sort of contradicts what I've said about the six pointer with Aston Villa, but that's because I think Aston Villa still deserve should be in the running to be to be relegated. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it'll be interesting to see either if Aston Villa gets sucked in or if this clarifies more. Because you'd have thought it's one of those situations where the point total is incredibly low, a couple of wins, and suddenly you're you're safe, right? The, the old 40 points thing probably isn't going to apply this season. No, um, I think uh, Mark Hughes has been roughly quoted as two more home wins that they think will be safe. That'll take them mm. to 37 points. I think he's probably about right. Blackpool went down with 39 last season. Ian Holloway still going on about that to this day. Can't believe that 39 points was you know, too little to keep them up. Um, but <laughs> Not quite right. how it I works, th- though, I is think it? Th- 35 or 36 will probably be a Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has become more of a divided league. People keep saying how competitive it is. I don't really buy it. Anyway, we're going to look at the weekend's fixtures, which, of course, include the FA Cup semi-finals, all of your weekend's football, and we'll find the value in it for you. You won't want to go anywhere. Welcome back to The Punter. We're going through this weekend's sporting action Headlined by, well, two massive events, the FA Cup semi-finals and the Grand National. We'll get to the Grand National, of course, that huge betting heat. Uh, but first of all, the FA Cup semi-finals. And the first one is a Merseyside derby. The second one happens to be a London derby. Uh, Liverpool uh, and Everton play on Saturday. And the FA Cup generally, a couple of corking semi-finals. Like in some recent years, Dan, it hasn't perhaps been that exciting, but a couple of great matchups, aren't they, for the neutral? It's an absolute dream for the FA that these mm. two matches have come about. Um, you know, the quarter-final draw, I left it very open, what with the Tottenham-Bolton scenario, and there, a couple of the games went to replays as well. So at the time, it was quite open-ended. But the way that the two matches have come together and the fact that they're at Wembley, and I think the FA have still got to you know, make a, a, a bigger case for these games being at Wembley, apart from the fact that we need to pay for it. Um, <laughs> that is the main case, I think. That's I think, the biggest yeah. case, isn't it? I think that, that you, having these two matches makes it all the, much sweeter for them. Right, because they're worthy of the stage it's, type of thing, that kind well, of argument. You, you, could, you could argue, on, as a Liverpool fan, Liverpool-Everton, Old Trafford, I don't think there'd be any complaints if that was the case, 75,000. Well, I'm happy it's at Wembley because it's less yeah, distance for me for to travel. And I think that's how they should organise the football fixtures. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy. Um, but yeah, let's have a look at to win the cup then. Uh, four teams left, funnily enough, at the semi-final stage. <laughs> And, uh, well, according to the market, the Merseyside derby is almost irrelevant because the London derby is going to provide the answer. I'm telling you, Tottenham on the form that they're on at the moment and the the players, uh, compared to a Chelsea team who who are full of uh, experienced players, big match players, your Drogba's, your Lampard's, Terry probably will be back for this game, Michael Essien, Petr Cech. I think that that Chelsea um, will beat... Tottenham, as much as I like Tottenham, I love watching them play. I think Chelsea will win that. And uh, I, think that, I think the winner will come from the other final. Oh, enough. really? I really do. Okay. And I think Everton, so you're saying there's some value there, if you think. Yeah, I yeah. certainly do. And I think Everton, and the way that David Moyes has gone about it, on the punter a few weeks ago, castigating him for, saying to, for, for, for leaving out uh, a number of players for the league game. Yeah, that, uh, I'm hoping he'll do that tomorrow, uh, it, Saturday. What, the, what do you think the chances it was, are? It was the, yeah, it was the uh, derby, wasn't it? He yeah. left a load of games that prelude in the, the game against Sunderland, which yeah, they drew yeah. the replay. In the end, it worked out for him. I just feel it could be their name on the cup this year. They've mm. um, certainly come together form-wise at the right time. They've either held or beaten the, you know, the best, best teams in the league. Um, so, so why not? Well, I guess the counter-argument would be that uh, Liverpool have won both the league meetings, meetings yeah. league meetings, and won them both reasonably comfortably. However, of course, Liverpool's recent form would argue against that because they've been astonishingly poor. Um, let's take a look at the odds going into the first semi-final, and as you can see, it's very tight. Liverpool's slight favourites, um, and I saw the betting butler who 
of course, punter viewers will know, he was saying that he thought Everton were great value because they should actually be favourites because they're in better form than Liverpool. Mm. I would disagree, actually. I think that you've got to go with the meetups between the two teams and say, well, look, when these two teams have met, Liverpool have won, so they should be slight favourites. But it's clearly pretty open, right? And particularly at Wembley as well. I presume the last two meetings that they've had at Wembley, mm. the 89 and 86 FA Cup finals, and Liverpool won both of them. I know that's. I wish we still had the 89 long, squad a long playing, way for, to, playing for Liverpool. You have to go a long way back for that. Yeah, but I think those players playing now would probably do slightly <laughs> better. At this age. At this age, at the yeah. Age of 50. Yeah, no, really. But, well, um, Everton. I, I agree with the Butler on, on current form and uh, the, the way that they're coming into it and the whole atmosphere around the club. It's a better place to be than Liverpool at the moment, especially after the well, events does, of how, this week. How does this happen? I mean, I can't, I can't believe this. They've announced today that they fired Camoli, the director of football, and their head of sports science and medicine, or whatever that means, the head of the fitness department, both going. How does that happen 48 hours between, before the biggest match of the season? That's just... Incompetent. Suddenly, your manager, instead of preparing the team, is answering questions to the media about upper management. It's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Liverpool do come into the match off the back of a win at Blackburn, a much needed victory. Yeah. Um, Andy Carroll scoring the winning goal. You never know, that might be the goal that propels him. Um, his status at the club mm. uh, higher than, you, know, you can't get any much lower than it is at the moment. So you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating game, uh, a very tight game nevertheless, I mean, uh, 11 to 5 the draw, you know, I wouldn't put anyone off that mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I, I, I can see the match going all the way. So that's the 90 minute odds we showed you, you've also got the to qualify odds so if you want to cover yourself in case of extra time penalties you'd rather just bet straight up, you can bet um, and as you can see Everton evens Liverpool slight odds on. It's about a 60-40 game is what the bookies are saying, pretty open. I'll make a case for Everton, you can make a case for Liverpool. Go but Everton on. made the 2009 FA Cup final. Um, they played Manchester United in the semis and beat them on penalties after a goalless draw. I think evens for Everton mm -hmm. is a very good price. I think the case for Liverpool is pretty straightforward. They've beaten Everton twice this season. Critically for Liverpool, they've got their first choice back four playing on Saturday, which they haven't had for about eight games because right. Daniel Lagger has been out, Glenn Johnson has been out. Um, however, that's all I can do because I'm pretty nervous about this game. I have no confidence in this Liverpool squad. You say back four, that's mm -hmm. fair enough. Back five. There you go. You have me there. Yeah, yeah. We've got somebody that hasn't played a football game for two years in goal, but don't worry about that. It's fine. Uh, let's move on quickly uh, to another, what looks like an open semi-final and tough one to call because both these teams have been a little bit rocky recently, Chelsea and Tottenham. Perhaps Chelsea getting their act together a little bit more of late. You can see the odds on screen right now. Again, another open semi-final. Roberto Di Matteo, for my money, has done a superb job at Chelsea uh, from taking over from Andre Villas-Boas. Uh, the club was in a, a bit of a mess. They were still in the Champions League, but for, for, for all everyone thought they were heading out of that. And he's come into the club, albeit, you know, just uh, just stepped up to the role because he was already in, in the background and he's done a, a pretty good job as far as I'm concerned. He's starting to get the sort of things out of Fernando Torres that uh, you know, we haven't seen for a couple of years. He's creating goals, he's scoring goals, he's looking more of a part. I think Chelsea at 11-5 to five for this game are a good bet. I think the huge thing that people don't talk about in football anymore is rotation. And I can remember, again as a Liverpool fan, I can remember Benitez getting slaughtered for rotating his squad. Of course, Ferguson, who wins league title after league title after league title, rotates more than any other manager. And when I look at these two teams, I see one team that's played the same first choice 11 any time they can walk all season and is now looking tired, jaded, not getting the results in Tottenham. And another team in Chelsea who just have so much more depth. They might not have, you know, you could argue first choice 11 who's got the better team but in terms of depth Chelsea have got so much more choice and they've got players that have been there and done it mm. at Wembley in semi-finals mm. um, beating Arsenal uh, on at least one occasion I think there might have been a couple of others in there they beat Manchester United to win the cup the first ever cup at the new Wembley and they okay. beat um, Portsmouth in the 2010 final let's have a look if you want to bet to qualify and you can see that uh, Spurs are slight favourites sorry I just hesitated there mm. because I'm back in Chelsea. The prices, I think, that's extraordinary. I, 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 I like Tottenham. If, yeah. I, if I don't like the term second team or anything like that, they are my second, second team, team. So you're pulling for them. Um, you know, I want them to win. Yeah. But I think as a, as a punter, Chelsea and Everton in this market are the ones you've got to be looking out for. Interesting stuff. OK, let's move on to the league and uh, the couple of games involving the title race contenders. 
Uh, Man City go to Norwich off the back of their big win against West Bromwich Albion. We'll check out the odds for this one. And uh, Man City favourites. Norwich, you've already talked about how well they've done. What a great job Paul Lambert's done. How do you feel about this at the price? You get 5-1 to one if you want Norwich at home to beat the second-place team. I'll be wanting more, I must admit. We saw Wigan 8-1 to one to beat Manchester United. I know Wigan are in a lower league position than Norwich, and Manchester City aren't in quite the form that Manchester United mm. were. But Norwich... Great comparison, though, because Wigan have got fighting for their lives. Norwich don't have so much to play for, so you'd have thought mm. Norwich should be a bit bigger. I like, uh, like I say, I like the way Norwich have gone about their business this season, but their record against the you know big teams at home hasn't been great. They were beaten by Arsenal, they were beaten by Manchester United, they were beaten by Tottenham, mm. and uh, I think they've still got to play Liverpool at home this season. Oh, but, that'd but be quaking. But, yeah, but generally, the, their record against the, the, the big four or five or six, or whatever you want to call it, hasn't been that good. Mm. So I'd, I'd be wanting more from that. I, I wouldn't back Manchester City at seven to four on because I don't like that short of prices, but, but they're, they're definitely. I definitely feel that they've got a bit of momentum off the back of the think, midweek win and, and, they, and they should win this. I think good for your accumulators, that's all I think. Because, I mean, with David Silva back, they just look a different team going forward. Let's move on. Uh, Man United, Villa. I think Villa routinely get absolutely nothing out of this fixture away at Old Trafford. Um, although they did well at Chelsea. So, yep. you know, they'll probably approach the game in the same way, the counter-attacking mentality. They had uh, a couple of years where, I don't know if you remember, the Federica Makeda game. Who no, I don't the, remember that. Very I don't last, remember that at all. Scored in the very last minute of the game. Aston Villa <laughs> was 2 0 up in, yeah, in the fixture. I, rem I remember it very, very. Uh, Manchester United won 3 2. That was a season that yes. United pipped Liverpool to yes, the Yes, I title. remember, Dan. Sorry. I was trying to get I you just, to just, move <laughs> off that <laughs> okay. painful and then, subject. And, and Villa did go and win at Manchester United, um, I think, the following season or the season after that. Right. Gabby Agbonlahor, I seem to remember having a pretty good game. 14 to 1 says it all in terms of the way that Aston Villa are going at the moment. They had a battling point against Stoke on Monday and they've got a lot of kids out there at the moment. 9-2 uh, to two on for Manchester United. You know, Rightly so, the price they are in the home form that they've showed this season. Mm. Um, completely unbackable, but uh, they're, they're, for me, obviously, I, I can see both United and City winning this week. Yeah, hard to see United having two bad performances in a row, isn't it? Uh, let's take a quick look at something a little bit different. The LMA Manager of the Year... Uh, mainly because this is a fascinating contest. I think you can make a case for several managers and quite a good case. And uh, Sir Alex Ferguson has really shortened up in this market. I think it's an interesting market where you could perhaps pick out uh, one or two, and the one or two I'm thinking of are Rodgers and Pardew, because this award doesn't necessarily go to one of the big club managers, does it? It doesn't. Um, Sir Alex Ferguson um, has done, you know, Another superb job with a Manchester United team that was perceived as many, a squad that was perceived as many, to be second rate to Manchester City this mm. season for long term, long times in this title race. They've trailed their, their great rivals and managed to turn it around to what was, until last night, an eight-point gap. Alan Pardew at 5-1 uh, to one has come right in in the morning. I think that, that we've seen a lot of money for Alan Pardew in recent weeks, and rightly so. Again, one of the most, I'd say one of the most hated men in football. That's probably too <laughs> harsh. But certainly when he took over at Newcastle last season from uh, Chris Hewton, a man that everyone seemed to love and couldn't understand why, mm. he certainly wasn't the man that people were looking to and thinking, well, he's going to do the job. He settled the team, and he's come back this season stronger. Some really astute signings, some superb signings there. And, uh, you know, at 5-1... to one, fully, ju fully well, deserved at the moment. The, the logical argument following through what you've been saying is if they did finish top four, I think he's an absolute banker for the manager of the year. There's just no way he doesn't get it because, you know, at the beginning of the season, the people are talking about them being relegated. So if you think he's, if you think Newcastle will finish top four, then double it with him getting LMA manager of the year at five to one. There were two um, outside bets there that I think, you know, maybe could have a say come the end of the season. David Moyes, if Everton do win the FA Cup, yep. at 40 to one now, that's a Really good mm -hmm. price. If Tottenham do win the FA Cup, big ifs, and they do finish you know, in the Champions League places, yeah, yeah. again, Harry Redknapp at forties as well, you know, would be would be fully deserved of it. Interesting. Uh, different market for you to consider. The one you're definitely not going to miss out on, though, is the Grand National. It takes place on Saturday. We're going to pick our way through it and find the value for you. Perhaps stop you betting on your boyfriend's girlfriend's dog's name that's a bit similar to horse number seven. <laughs> Keep it here, and we'll do the Grand National after this break. Welcome back to the punter. It's Grand National time, the biggest race 
of the horse racing year in the UK, possibly in the world. This race is obviously a traditional punter's frenzy. Probably not the professional punter, though. This is more of a casual punter, perhaps their one bet of the year, that kind of thing. But we're going to try and find some value for you. That's really the summation of it, isn't it, Dan? It's, this, is a, this is a race that everybody likes to have a bet on, but probably you wouldn't encourage people to have serious money on. No, certainly not. It's definitely a sweepstake. You know, race, mm. and that's the only money that I've won on, on, in the national over the past, <laughs> you know, <laughs> since it started. Really, for me, um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a real tough one to call. It's such a demanding race. Uh, it's one that, from experience, generally, like you say, um, professional punters try and steer clear of because it's just so wide open. Forty horses. Mm. You know, that's a, it's a big big field. Forty horses in a cavalry charge with mm. quite large obstacles in the way. Sounds like fun. Uh, let's take a look at the market. And this race has been electrified by the presence of the Gold Cup winner who leads this market, Synchronised. Just talk about that for a second because it's, it's really kind of shapes the market, doesn't it? What you think about this race depends what you think about him running in it. Well, I was at Cheltenham, um, what was it, four weeks ago? Mm. Four weeks ago this weekend, uh, the Gold Cup uh, where synchronised, uh, you know, surprised a lot of people by beating much more fancied horses in the race, like Long Run and Corte Star. AP McCoy is certainly a jockey that you'd want to be backing going up that Cheltenham Hill, and uh, you know, uh, if he's in with a shout, if, you, if you're in with a shout with a McCoy horse, you'd be very happy going into those final few furlongs. He also won the National in 2010 on with uh, Don't Push It, mm -hmm. so he does have a. Uh, Recent good history in the race, but I think seven to one for a horse, which is, you know, literally still recovering really from that Gold Cup run. And so the, the obvious question is, when did a horse last win the Gold Cup and then win the national? 1934. 1934. Two years before my granddad was born. Wow. Uh, so this is not something that happens. Golden a Miller, lot, right? Uh, who has a bar named after him at Cheltenham nowadays. And yeah, no, uh, it's it's a, it's a massive massive ask. I know it's Ballard Briggs in there at twelve to one, last year's winner. You, you're going back to Red Run for the last time that mm. a uh, a horse won it two years on the trot. I genuinely think this year we could see uh, for the first time our first female jockey winner. We've got mm. two who um, who are in you know pretty good form, and they've got both got good horses. OK, great. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I just want to bring in uh, a racing journalist who's going to pick our way through this. Charlie Hoynes is on the line. Charlie, thanks for stopping by and giving us your overview of the National. We've just been talking about synchronised running. How do you see him performing so soon after the Gold Cup win? Well, he's a horse that gives everything. And if you look at the Gold Cup, uh, the running, two miles from home, he was being driven, hard driven by Tony McCoy to keep up, keep up with the pace. He managed uh, to do that quite well, but when he hits the national, has he got time enough to recover from those exertions? I think it would have taken a lot out of him. I don't think J.P. McManus or John Joe O'Neill would risk the horse if they weren't sure he had recovered. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. But my, my worry about him is his jumping. Mm. He's not the greatest of jumper, and uh, over four and a half miles, he will be jumping rather large fences when he's uh, out, of, out on his feet. So... That could be a problem, and you, you, the price is wrong as well. You know, for for a horse um, that hasn't experienced these fences before, that's had a hard, hard race. However, um, you know, he's going into this race. He's probably four, five pounds at least ahead of a handicapper going right. into this race. But he's carrying top weight. It'd be a, a heck of a feat if they can pull it off. I mean, Hedge Hunter almost pulled it off a couple of years ago, carrying top weight. He finished second, yeah. a gallant second there. So. It can be done, but whether synchronised is the horse to do it, I doubt it. And the price for me isn't generous enough. No, I think that's the general feeling among kind of professionals looking at this race. Just give a sense, sense Charlie, coming from Cheltenham and then uh, having a hard race at Cheltenham and then running again at Aintree so soon afterwards, how do horses generally do in that situation? Well, it, it, it's very it much depends on the horse's constitution. Some horses will eat up really well after the race. I mean, they, they, do, they do lose a great deal of the kilos uh, uh, going over these marathon trips. And if the horse has eaten up well and the horse has uh, got a hard constitution, he'll, come, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be ripe for the race. And don't forget, this year, there's a four-week gap between the Gold Cup and the, the Grand National. Normally, it's three. So he has mm -hmm. had this extra week to prepare. I was saying that, when he won the Lexus Chase in Ireland earlier this year, 
they were loath to then run him in the Hennessy with just a three-week break. And the, the Lexus was only over three miles. So you do have to wonder. OK. Charlie, uh, I know you're pretty sweet on the possibility of uh, our first female jockey winner of the uh, National. Organised Confusion and Seabass, both 20 to 1 shots with uh, Coral, our, our betting partners. Uh, what are your thoughts on those two? Well, Organised Confusion uh, won the Irish Grand National under Nina Carberry last year. Since then, he's been uh, campaigned over, well, really short trips, two miles, two and a half miles, trips that weren't going to see his handicap marker uh, get, get uh, hammered ahead of the, his... Well, obviously, they plotted this race after he won the Irish National. And I think he's well-weighted. I'm always slightly worried about horses that haven't faced the aim three fences before, be it in the Beaches or the Topham in previous years. You know, mm. you know, so there is that worry. But Nina Carberry, she's won at Cheltenham. She's won countless cross-country chases uh, um, around Cheltenham. She's won the, champion, the, the, the National Hunt Chase over four miles. She's a top jockey. She can certainly do the business. Um, the other horse uh, that would be ridden by a female is Seabass. Uh, she, he'll, she, he'll be ridden by Katie Walsh. Uh, for, um, her dad, uh, Ted Walsh, is the trainer. Seabass has won his last six. But once again, he's a horse that um, hasn't faced his fences. And he's, I mean, last time out, he won over two and a half miles. In his career, he's only won once over three miles, and that was in a point to point. He's really entering uh, two different arenas. One arena, can he jump these fences? And two, can he actually stay the trip? Mm. Two big risks, and I don't think 20 to 1 is enough for me to be excited about that. However, okay, organised confusion at 20s is of interest to me. Okay, so organised confusion, a little bit of interest there. If you take Synchronise out, it looks like a very open race. Who else is jumping out at you? Who else would you point our viewers the way of? Well, you really, really have to pay attention to West End Rocker. Um, Alan King's horses have run very well today. Uh, um, Grimetti won the juvenile hurdle. And uh, Medamay ran a good race in fourth in the, in the bowl chase. And West End Rocker hacked up. I mean, I mean, genuinely hacked up in the beach chase in November over these fences, but over a shorter trip. Love, he seemed to love, love the challenge of the big fences. Any rain that comes, and there is a bit uh, on the way, um, will suit him down to the ground, because on that occasion, the, the gr ground was riding heavy. West End Rocker's he's deep, got a decent weight. And uh, interestingly enough, Wayne Hutchinson, not the stable jockey, uh, Robert Thornton, Chop Thornton, uh, be Wayne Hutch Hutchinson on board. And that's because he's ridden him uh, previously and uh, Alan King's and the owners are staying faithful to him. I was like that. That's a nice touch. Yeah. West End Rock is very decent. And at round 12 to 1, yeah, he's not the great biggest prize, but that's probably a true, true reflection of, of uh, his potential to win the race. There are okay. some decent uh, horses as well. I love the look of Killy Glenn's uh, form profile, an Irish trained horse. He was, uh, he was fourth, well, fourth from home last year in the race. He tipped up, and he was in third place at the time and travelling really strongly. This time round, he gets in carrying £10 less than what he was carried last year. Wow. The rating has only dropped by £4, but the presence of synchronised has compressed the weight. So he'll be carrying £10 less. Um, since that run, they gave him a soft pallet operation to improve his wind, and the only run he's had since then over fences... Uh, was in the conditions race in Ireland, and he won it quite convincingly, and his jockey, Robbie Power, got off and said, yeah, that, that operation has worked the treat. So at 20-1, to 1, I think Killy Glenn has an outstanding chance. He's, done, he's been in the race, uh, he handles the fences, he stays, and we clearly, clearly he's got more improvement to come at courtesy of this operation. So that that's sounds, a nice one there. Yeah, it sounds like a good recommendation, especially like the fact that he is perhaps a little bit ahead of the handicapper on, on that one. Now, one of the worst things that can happen in the Grand National is that you have a bet, you get all excited, and then your horse falls at the first fence. It's happened to me many times. Uh, oh. you, can, you can make that a little bit more exciting, though. There are some interesting bets you can have. One of them is how many first fence fallers. Uh, you can we'll actually bet on this. First fence fallers. <laughs> Easy. Uh, yeah, um I, 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 well, what sort of price ranges are you going for the number of fallers? Well, if you, you can uh, have no fallers at 5 to 2, one faller at 2 to 1, 2 to 3 fallers at 7 to 4. So it's pretty open, Charlie. All right, you know, I'd be, I think uh, now the fences have, have been, um, well, they're, they're softer. They're, they're, they're softer brush to the fences now. I think the jockeys have all been warned about going too off too fast, too reckless. Be Five years, six years ago, 
before you got the top quality horses running in the race, you used to get a load of nags, a load of outsiders that really shouldn't, that weren't good enough to be in the race. Yeah. Now, it's so competitive. The, all the horses that take part are decent horses. They're all rated men, you know, around about 138. So they're very good horses, very good jumpers. And they all train, all the owners will think they have a genuine chance. So I think the bet of no fallers at the first fence is probably the safest because the jockeys will want their horses to get round. It's not like before when they used to scoot off in front, the, the 151 outsider, just so the owner could see his horse. It's yeah, a bit, of TV, like bit of TV time no, is what it, what it used to be about. Um, OK, we've got another market which is also a bit of fun, which is the age of the winner of the oh. Grand National. Um, now, maybe this gives you a little bit of a clue to where you should be going with your money. Uh, nine years or younger is even money. Um, is it a young horse's race, Charlie? Is that how you see it? Well, uh, for me, uh, if I'm looking for a horse at this race, I'm looking at a horse around about nine years old, ten years old. Um, I, I think they need to have the, they need to be a bit more stamina laden, and that kicks in around about nine, ten. So I'd expect that to be the age range. So what would be the price for a ten-year-old? Uh, ten two to one, I can give you, Charlie. Pardon? Two to one, I can give you. Two to one sounds like a fair bet to me. I'd probably go that angle there, and uh, that brings in a, a, a number of uh, interesting, interesting runners there as, as well. I mean, there is a 13-year-old running in this race, actually, um, the, uh, Black Apalachee, and I wouldn't. He's not without a place prospect. Uh -huh. um, he, he finished second in the race two years ago behind Don't Push It. Uh, and since then, he, he was off with a little bit of a leg injury. He's come back into training, finished second last time out behind Prince Bosheen. Uh, Prince Bosheen was the anti-post favourite for this race until he was pulled out uh, a week and a half ago. So back Appalachian, okay. then he's got a bit of form and is at a decent price. He's Great. a 13-year-old, mind. Great stuff, Charlie. Um, thank you so much for that. You've really uh, given us some excellent tips. I appreciate it a lot. Enjoy the National. Thanks, Charlie. Well, I will do. And you too. Uh, OK, Dan, just time to tell us where your money's actually going to go. I know, I know you're going to have a bet. Everyone has a bet. You're throwing darts at the after ball, what, don't After you? what Charlie's told us, yeah. I think I might fancy an each way shot at Killy Glenn. Killy Glenn, yeah, sounds like a good recommendation, doesn't it? I'll go for um, whichever one is black. I like black horses. Black Abakashi. There you go. There you go. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> I'm on in a big way. Uh, have fun with the National. Please don't make it your biggest bet of the year. Make it... Do lots of £2 bets and check out the novelty markets, that kind of thing. That's what the Nationals for. Uh, we're going to come back with more sport. The Chinese Grand Prix is happening this weekend, and we'll also give you some other picks. Keep it right here. More punter after this. Welcome back to The Punter we're going through this weekend. Sporting action and finding the value for you as ever. This is the show that is on your side. Uh, now, we're going to look at the Grand Prix. It's happening in China and a uh, pretty big betting market, the Grand Prix nowadays, and Formula One bigger than ever. Um, you like a bit of Formula One, don't you, Dan? I don't mind it. Um, I'm, I'm, I must say, I think the last time I won a season, more or less to its full, was around about the sort of time that Damon Hill uh, was uh, still involved. But, okay. uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's become more fascinating to watch, I think, in, in, in the last couple of years with the mm. various rules that they've introduced and, you know, in terms of keeping the teams at you know, a level playing field and actually finding the best uh, racer on the track is uh, yeah, certainly made it a better betting market anyway. Yeah, it's been fascinating this season as well with Vettel, kind of the consensus best driver, but probably not in the best car, has made it... One of those markets has divided opinion slightly between yes. the McLarens and the... There was a few things that Lewis Hamilton said last season which I found quite interesting because he sort of got away with basically saying that the car's no good. Oh, right. you know, it's not me, it's the car. And he, he said it on a number of occasions and mm. I thought either you're trying to construct your own dismissal here or you've got the full backing of the team and they are going to come back stronger next year. Yeah. And they have. And they have. Uh, well, let's check out the Chinese Grand Prix odds. This is the race winner. And as you can see, Jensen Button is the favourite. Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel. Fernando Alonso, fourth favourite. You'd think probably more on the strength of his result than yes. his actual chances um, in this race. Lewis Hamilton, uh, 100 to 30, I'm afraid, isn't a, isn't a good enough price for me. So for people that don't know, something's happened with yeah. him. In he's got qualifying. a five. Uh, he's going to be not fi back five places on the grid mm. uh, for whatever qualifying time that he, 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 he reaches. He will start five places further back because uh, the team have changed his gearbox. 
uh, in time for the race, which I don't know the full ins and outs of, uh, but obviously they've done it to help him out and help the car out. So I think 100 to 30 about Lewis Hamilton isn't a big enough price, but I can see why, because Lewis Hamilton won the race last year mm -hmm. and he also won it on his, on his way to the title in 2008. So he, you know, he knows the Shanghai track well, and obviously that's been taken into account with this price. Jensen Button won the race in 2010. Uh, so two to one favourite there and he's also of course got a, a race win under his belt already this season um, Vettel won the race in 2009 so he knows it as well Michael Schumacher and Kimi Raikkonen are, are both former winners of the race and obviously Raikkonen back this season for Lotus and Michael Schumacher in his second season on his way back both big prices for this but I always always think that you know a bit of uh, track knowledge goes mm. uh, quite a long way in motorsport Probably too big a price for an outright winner, but maybe uh, you know as a, an each a way finish. Michael Schumacher, why not twenty yeah. to one? Hey, it could rain. Who knows? Uh, let's check out the winning car odds. So if you want to bet team rather than individual, uh, that's how it lines up. McLaren, of course, with the well, what is viewed as the best car right now, are odds on, and this will probably be pretty standard for the next couple of races unless something dramatic happens. This these prices. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we had the uh, Ferrari winning uh, in Malaysia uh, last time out and uh, uh, with Fernando Alonso so uh, a nine to one about them is, is a pretty decent price in terms of you know a team in form but I think five to two Red Bull with Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber two you know fantastic drivers is a, is a is a good price to get stuck into because you know they haven't had the best of starts to the season they've had a bit of a you know a couple of just two or three week break to sort of get it in order mm. and we wait and see what sort of car they come back with but you know the, the, no, without a shadow of a doubt the, t the team in form are McLaren and uh, 11 to 8 on you know if you're going to put some pretty big money on something this weekend I think that might be the place where it would go. Okay uh, let's put this in context and look at the drivers championship odds. Well, just a couple of races in of course one of those uh, races surprise result Lewis Hamilton remains the favourite Jensen Button second and Vettel still at almost three to one I mean if they did get the car sorted out you could see in two or three weeks time that almost three to one about Sebastian Vettel looking like a big price only 18 to one about Mark Webber maybe again mm. for it maybe for an each way bet of some sort 18 to one that's a that's a huge price I think Fernando Alonso has been overpriced there at eight to one I don't think the Ferrari team are necessarily up to it this season and uh, Fernando Alonso although you know, he was the uh, winner a couple of years running uh, back in the mid noughties I don't think that he's the racer that he was you know, at one time. It's fantastic for, for us Brits to see Lewis Hamilton and mm -hmm. Jensen Button at the top of the prices in, you know, for things like this. And, uh, hey, it's know, Olympic year. Uh, We're uh, going to win everything uh, this yeah, year. Andy Dan Murray's going to win Wimbledon in he England. Is. They're going to win the Euros. That's so. what's going to happen. Don't, don't, don't tell me it isn't true. Don't crush my dreams. <laughs> Uh, now this weekend, one other thing that we should cover off is the big championship game. Uh, Southampton are playing Reading, and that's a huge, huge match. You know, take away obviously the FA Cup semi-finals. I think uh, for football-wise, this weekend this is the biggest match, mm. bar none. Southampton against Reading, first against second, only goal difference separating them in the championship. This is perceived as many as a title decider, and a defeat for one of the other teams brings possibly West Ham back into play for the automatic promotion chances you know yeah. that, I think the gap at the moment is something like five or six points well you know a defeat for one and a win for West Ham at the weekend will bring West Ham back into it uh, Southampton have been superb all season Ricky Lambert has scored a phenomenal amount of goals he's now got Billy Sharp alongside him as well Reading have been uh, the informed team in 2012 uh, and uh, Brian McDermott has done a fantastic job there he really has and uh, he's well liked linked with the Wolves job about they wish so, they had gone for him now well, they, it's, it's going to be it's, go, it's going to be a really interesting match how much do you like Reading then because I can tell you they're 11 to 5 is a little bit bigger than 2 to 1 if you want to back Reading big enough price to actually bat them to win the game or you think that Southampton will be too strong I think Southampton at home uh, a different proposition to Southampton away mm -hmm. And uh, it was only up until at this turn of the year, I think, on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, that they actually lost for the first time at home in over two years. So with Reading winning at West Ham, you'd want a bigger earlier price in the maybe. Week, and West Ham and Reading won at Brighton on yeah. Tuesday night mm -hmm. as well. I don't know. I think Southampton, you know, because they are such a, a good team at St Mary's. Mm -hmm. Is it eleven to five? Did you say about Reading? Eleven to five. Reading. Yeah. It's not a bad bet, not a bad, not bad bet. bet. Okay, well, uh, let's go from not a bad bet. Just quickly, so we're running out of show. Your bet of the weekend would be. 
If I was going to put them into a double, I'd fancy uh, Chelsea and Everton. Uh, what would you get around about that? About four to one, maybe, as a double for them to win? Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to remember the odds. Evens, like that. both evens to qualify overall. Yes, yeah, to so, qualify overall. Yeah. Chelsea and Everton. I'm not going to put you off that. Uh, my bet of the weekend is that the Liverpool management will do something ridiculous by the end of the weekend. It's about 10 to 1 on, but it's like finding money in the street. Have a fantastic weekend, whatever you're betting on. Enjoy the Grand National. If you can't enjoy this sporting weekend, then uh, you want to check your pulse, I think. It's going to be a good one. More from the punter next week. Until then, take care and run good. Stay ahead of the game with Sports Tonight Live. Don't miss a thing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Search for Sports Tonight Live on Facebook and like our fan page. Follow Sports Tonight TV on Twitter and tweet us your thoughts and opinions. Sports Tonight Live, it's the platform for the fans.